the results were a little different than what I heard from other sources on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that was also around the time that Splitter came out. Um, I played yep. around a lot with Splitter, and uh, Splitter was 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 quite good at the time. Again, yeah. this is this is late 2019. This is yeah. this is almost this is the the Stone Age of of where we are now. <laughs> Sorry, right. yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's a ancient thread. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the February episode of our podcast, Spatial Audio Monthly, also known as the SEM Show, where we talk about all things uh, spatial audio. My name is Michael Wagner, and next to me is my co-host, Sam Hawking. Hello. <laughs> Today we have a really interesting guest, Anthony, uh, and uh, we are going to switch things around a little because Andrew has to leave a little, Anthony has to leave a little early. So um, we are going to start with the discussion with Anthony and I'm going to simply turn it over to Sam and Sam, Anthony, yeah. let's start it off. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, many thanks for joining us, Anthony. Um, it's taking Thank a little while to get, taking a little while to get you here, but uh, you're a busy mm -hmm. man. Um, yeah. So it's all all perfectly fine. Um, I mean, I'm a quite a big user of the, one of the products that you you work on, UVR five Ultimate uh, Vocal mm -hmm. Remover, um, which is kind of even though my main interest is spatial audio, I use the tools to create stems to separate out spatially. So that's that's where I've heard about you. But tell us a little bit about about you and um, how you. I know the UVR. My project is kind of like the GUI of, of a pre-existing vocal remover, a little more command line type product. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, explain, that's true. Explain why you got into it, what your interest in is in, uh, you know, audio source separation and, uh, you know, what, what, why you, why you um, continue to work, work on UVR5 and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I've always been into audio. I've always been into music. Um, yeah. It's always really been a passion of mine. I guess to kind of get started from the very beginning, um, I work in IT. Uh, that's my day job. Uh, I, I I do IT security, so I'm I'm already familiar with all things all things IT related. Um, and I've always been a huge music buff, music fan. Um, I've made music. I I understand certain aspects of music, um, and I've always been I've always wanted to be able to to hear instrumental versions of songs and stuff. Uh, so I remember one day I was uh, back. I want to say in late 2019, I was uh, I was on GitHub and I was just kind of looking around uh, for for stem separators because I found out that that started to become a thing after I discovered uh, uh, it was I can't remember the name of the service, but there was a there was an AI service. I think it was called Phonic Mind. I think that's what it was. Uh, okay. Yep. I discovered a service that was like that. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is this this exists. Right, this is yeah. possible, and yeah. um, I started looking around GitHub to see if there's any open source versions of it, and then I found uh, there was a there was one called Vocal Remover. It was made yeah. by a by a developer in Japan. Yeah, and um, that's kind of what kicked things off. And um, I installed it. I I started using it, and I saw that it was actually quite good. Uh, yeah. the model was basic, but it was better than anything I'd ever tried prior to that. Yeah. So uh, I. I used it and I was just really impressed with the results and I started going down the rabbit hole <laughs> and yeah. uh, I started kind of borderline obsessing over it. Like, like, how is this happening? How does this work? Yeah. Um, the results were a little different than what I heard from other sources on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was also around the time that Splitter came out. Um, I played yep. around a lot with Splitter and uh, Splitter was, was, was quite good at the time. Again, yeah. this is this is late 2019. This is yeah. this is almost this is the the stone age of of where we are now. <laughs> Sorry, right? yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's ancient, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I remember when I used uh, Splitter, I was I was impressed with the results, but I I didn't I wasn't crazy about the results. Yeah, uh, they sounded a bit washed out, and it, like there's still a lot of bleed. And vocal remover, the uh, the 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 repo I found on GitHub uh, was made by the, the Japanese developer. I think his name is Turismo. I, I don't know how to say yeah, his I, name. Yeah, I've got it written down. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's spelled T S U R. Yes. Yeah. U M S O. To, yeah. Suremaso. Turemaso, maybe. There you something, go. Yes. Yes. Something like yeah. That. Yeah. 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 Um, I I liked that one better because I felt like the uh, the stems were a little clearer. 
Yeah, um, yeah. And what, what was that at the time? What what model was that? Was it only a vocal and instrument that was, separator? That was, Is that that was it? Yeah, it, it just did two stems. It was two a two stem, stem yeah. separator, two stem model, um, yeah, yeah. dual stem model. Uh, and Sweeter did four, I believe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I I I never really dig too much into into Sweeter's uh in into Sweeter's code like I did with uh, VR MDXNet and Dmux, but yeah. uh but. I believe speed splitter was just it was a multi-stem removal. I was at the time I was more interested in dual stems because I just wanted to do vocal and instrumental. And uh when I did the uh when I played around with uh with vocal remover, I saw how good it was and I wanted to figure out how to train my own models. So I started off using my my laptop, which is a <laughs> which is pretty weak at the time. I mean it was I, I couldn't really train much. I think I trained on like I trained with incredibly low settings and uh, I started with a really small data set of like maybe, you know, hundred or 200 samples. And um, it, 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 the model came out better than what, than, than the default that uh, VR came out with. So uh, I, I was, I, I was even more impressed by the results and I was just like, oh, wow, this can get better. So I started yeah. to, I started to, uh, Get a faster GPU. <laughs> Get a faster GPU. Yeah. Uh, build a better computer. Uh, yeah. And at the time, I think I got one. I went from one. The first model I trained was on six gigabytes of VRAM, uh, 1060. Uh, yeah, 1060 Nvidia, I believe. It, that's the one that was on the laptop with six with six gigs of VRAM, which is barely enough to get a good model. So I upgraded uh, to a. Uh, I can't remember the name of that model. Uh, the name of that GPU. It was a. Uh, it was it was a it was a twelve or eleven gigabyte GP. I'll just say that it was Nvidia. Obviously, I had to be, uh, and that I was able to kind of expand uh, training a bit more, and uh, I started getting better models. And so when I started getting better models, it's like, well, you know, I, I really want to wrap a GUI around this, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to. I, I and I was really the project was really just for me. I didn't really, I didn't intend for it to become this big thing. So, um, yeah, yeah. I at the time I was still. Uh, I, even though I was really into all things IT, uh, yeah, pro programming was still a weak point for me at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I understood it to a degree. I was able to read, you know, kind of read it a little bit, but I wasn't like nowhere near where I am now. So sure. yeah. I, uh, I remember I, I went to Fiverr, uh, Fiverr that site where you, you can yeah, find yeah. people, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's where I found uh, Boskin Dylan. Ah, uh, right. Okay. The, yeah, he's he's, he's one of the early one of the code earlier. Yeah, yeah. The earlier I, I still yeah. I, I still credit him. Yeah, and uh, that's where I met him. And um, I asked him. I said, "Hey, I, I want to turn this into a GUI. Can you help me?" And uh, you know, I I I paid him some. Uh, I I uh, contracted him basically to to help me get it started. And uh, so he so he and I kind of worked together. I showed him what my vision was. This is how I wanted it to look. This is the idea that I had. I, I just, I just want something that's easier for me to use. I just don't want to have to keep using the command line. So I, uh, so he made a very bare bones stripped down, like early version of it. Uh, uh, if, if you go through uh, UVR's old repo, you'll see the very first iteration of it. Like yeah. If you so go that was way like back to the history. Like version two or something. And now we're version yeah. five. So yeah, quite a, yeah. Quite it a had lot of a, development. It, it, it looked uh, it looked very bare. It, it had very few options. It was uh, it, uh, it was uh, it had a very ugly banner that I made. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, but 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 Dylan was great. And like he and I he and I worked really really well together. And uh, you know we kind of took the conversation off of fiber. We started kind of discussing things more about like yeah how can we make this a little bit better. And you know um, he's a he's a very 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 talented coder. Very very good. Uh, excellent he did he he uh, uh he kind of built the foundation the early foundation for what it is now like he because it's like you know if you if you if you kind of compare it to building a house like he kind of he kind of poured the foundation right like sure and and so, kind of helped me put the blueprints together go ahead so was that using um models that you create yourself uh yeah. tweaked yeah so mm -hmm. even yeah that was the very even, first yeah, even the very, first stage, very, yeah. Very, very, very first stage. The earliest iteration of vocal remover uh, of, of uh, I can't pronounce his name, Turismo, uh, his first, like, I think his uh, V2 of his vocal remover. So, so those models really weren't that strong, and the data set really wasn't that strong either. And on GitHub, uh, I, 
I think it was about maybe two months in, I decided, you know what, this this project looks pretty good. I should post it on GitHub. So I posted on GitHub and I called it Ultimate Vocal Remover. I I just kind of, the name just kind of came to me. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't really have, I couldn't really think of anything better because I wanted to call it something, but I didn't know what to call it. So I just said, you know, Ultimate Vocal Remover. This is, this is to me, the best vocal remover I could find. I've, I, I've created myself. So to me, this is the Ultimate Vocal Remover. So that's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> well, to credit, to credit you, it probably still is, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah. even up against... But for, for those that, that aren't aware of it, because there will be listeners that just don't know what the hell we're talking about at the moment, probably. But it's a it's an application that you download, you install it on your computer, it runs on um, CPU, but it's a lot better and faster on a GPU. Um, and essentially, it takes in a stereo source and it spits out stems or um it, it, instruments and a vocal um from that from that source and and you've created the the application that basically eases the point of entry i guess you'd call it in that you don't need to know anything about i guess it's mainly python and you don't need to run stuff from a command line and get so geeky about it you can literally drag and drop a file in and it pumps out what you want and you can tweak some settings and yeah, and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, to put it in perspective, you've got commercial uh, services like um, Lalal and um, oh, I can't, can't remember some of the names. Um, uh, you basically pay them per the minute or per the song to separate them. And an ultimate vocal, vocal remover stands up to those and often uh, does a better job as well, um, even though it's completely free. So. Um, yeah. And uh, and yeah. by the way, for those of you who are watching on the video version of this podcast, we're going to leave links in the description so you can check that out yeah. yourself. Yeah, we will do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, sorry, ca carry on with. No, no, so your I... your so your story got to the the point that you you you've launched this product. It's um, it's followed on from the Japanese uh, developer to take uh, it into a GUI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, originally, and mm -hmm. and I guess. Yeah, carry, carry on with the journey up to the point that we're at now, because I guess quite a lot has changed. Even oh, yeah, in the last, <laughs> even, well, even in the time that I've known it for the last two That's years even, or so, it's changed a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it catapulted into something completely different uh, from yeah. its original, from, from my original goal. It, it, it just kind of took on a life of its own. Sure. Um, I, uh, from that point, whenever I, I first put it, posted on GitHub, uh, it, and I posted the models that I had trained on GitHub as well, uh, it started getting more traction. And, you know, people finally had a, cause, cause, cause Turismo's uh, vocal remover was, was already gaining popularity in and of itself. But then people saw there was a GUI version of it that I posted with, with slightly better models. So people started using that. And, uh, that's where it caught the attention of Offrey. Well, I call him Offrey. I mean, uh, he's a, by screen name a u f r 33. He's, uh, he was the, uh, he's the other developer, main developer, core developer, I credit. And he found me on GitHub and he, he, he posted on one of the issues and said, Hey, uh, you know, there's, there's some imperfections here that I think I can help you with. <laughs> and, uh, I gave him my email and then that, that took UVR in a new direction too. So he, he and I started talking data and like, you know, w w how the models could be better. And, uh, we kind of got together and made it even better. Yep. So he, he was, we, uh, he's a, coder as well um, he's also in, yeah he's also a programmer into uh, training and ai models and stuff yeah right yeah okay. he runs uh he runs x minus ah, okay yeah yeah sure right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh so, so we so we got together we we get we, we put our heads together and we're trying to figure out ways to make things better and uh he had a multi-band approach so he edited the the original vr code to add multi-band uh training to it which is sure. basically a, a way for so to kind of put just to, in, just to explain to people that yeah. To be unaware, VR is one of the architectures that is used in VR architecture. Um, VR architecture, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's like there's others like um, DMUX and MDX, and is that is that is yep, that that's fair correct. fair summation? Yeah, okay, that's correct. Yeah, um, great stuff. It's yeah. one of the it, it's one of the process methods, is what I call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are the AIs? So I mean, really, uh, 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 UVR has has three separate AI networks. No, well, really four actually, technically. Uh, First being VR, MDXNet, uh, DMUX, and then MDX, MDXNet 23C, which is actually the newest version of MDXNet. 
it is technically a different network, but it shares some components with the original IBX net. So, so it was, I, I've had to code them all in. Uh, but, but, but at this part of my story where, where I'm at is that it, it only had VR in it and, uh, Offering the, uh, the 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 other developer I started working with, he kind of introduced uh, multi a multi band approach, which is uh, I guess to kind of to, to find a way to to kind of explain this on a more simplistic level. Uh, basically, VR uses audio spectrograms, like it analyzes audio spectrograms, it converts them to the uh, FFT spectrogram, yep. and it uses which it, which I'm sure most of the audience probably knows that spectrograms are basically just heat maps. Of yep. audio, of audio, you yeah, actually yeah. see see the frequency. So the AI AI basically looks at those and uh, you know determines like what the vocals look like and what it doesn't. Uh, now VR specifically only uses magnitude spectrograms, not phase, because there are because there's you know uh, magnitude being uh, which is what represents the intensity of each frequency, so you can see it more, and then phase uh, representing uh, the timing of where. That data is uh, phase is a whole hell of a lot harder to to predict um, on a spectrogram than magnitude is, and VR only focuses on magnitude only. It 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 it, uh, uh, it actually uses the original phase from the mixture, like it saves the original phase from the mixture when it does a process, and it just does the magnitude. So that's part of the reason why VR tech tend to tends to have more artifacts in it, and you get that and and. You'll hear at certain points. Some people think it sounds cleaner or clearer, but but what you're but what the drawback is is that you end up getting uh, an instrumental that sounds a little bit more uh, smeared. Like there's a smeared sound, like a like it sounds a little bit more synthetic because the phase from the mixture is still in there, and so you can hear it. It sounds and you can hear the vocal sound a little bit statically. That's just that's the phase. That's that 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 didn't get processed. So. So even though it technically sounds better, I guess to some in some songs do I can say. Yeah, it's might... important to say that there's no there's no one one hit solution which always works the best. It, right. you, a lot of the fun of it on the the rabbit mm -hmm. hole that you go down is there's a million and one ways that you could yeah. demix something. And yeah. Even though something like we can we'll probably get onto SDR and stuff like that and. How yeah. pe people try and get to the top of a, an SDR kind of ranking, um, but yeah, it's it, not always the best way to approach demixing a song because the song correct. itself can determine what might work better than others. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, and it's always it's going to differ based on whatever track you're using. I think for acoustic yep. tracks that don't have a whole lot of noise in it, I guess. Yeah, like uh, hot, lower transient kind of content. Right. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, like if you like if it's only a metal song, like. Uh, in all, because I've I've played around with just about any genre, every genre you can think of, and one of the hardest genres to remove vocals from cleanly is metal, metal or or, or anything that has a metal and 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 uh, tracks that non acoustic tracks that have really heavy vocals in them, like really vocal centered. Uh, mixes, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Or, um, or heavy. So that full, it's like a full spectrum sound, like very right, white yeah. noise, quite white noisy. Yeah. So if, the, if, if the vocals have more intensity, higher yeah. intensity, if they're mixed, if they're mixed with higher intensity, yeah. uh, they're typically going to be harder to remove. And if the instrumental has a lot of intensity, if there's a lot of noise, like you get in like yeah. distortion, like distorted guitar from metal, it's going to be harder. It's yeah, you're going to yeah, get more yeah. of a muddy sound. So I guess it, so after so after uh, uh, Offrey had, I call him Offrey. I I, I uh, he, uh, which is the other developer I started to work with, uh, whenever he started, he he took on a multiband approach, which basically just uh, uh, before you just got the one spectrogram. Uh, you basically, what he coded in is that it it, it learned based on on uh, uh, different resolutions. So I was trying to explain resolutions. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> that's a whole, that's a whole other. Is it? There's it, it, so, uh, yeah. so many. There's so many parts of it. I guess to to kind of make it uh, to to kind of make it easier to explain. Basically, uh, he made it so that uh, multiband. Uh, let's say you, let's say when you see a model that says three band, it yeah. means that like he has the bottom band of, of like maybe between uh, zero to let's say seven hundred hertz. Uh, has one resolution, maybe a, maybe a, a finer resolution because those are usually the, the the harder frequencies to get to, and then like frequency between seven hundred and let's say three thousand, or might have 
a different resolution, and then everything above that's going to have a different resolution. So that's basically what he means by by multi-band. Uh, multi-band. It's like each band, each, each certain uh, a three band will have just different resolutions. On yeah, them. and you, yeah. you'll find typically a vocal will be in a certain band, and a right, bass yeah. will obviously be in a lower band, and mm-hmm. um, so you can exactly. you can optimize it based on the what you're trying to separate, basically. I guess, it, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so with that, that was uh that 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 made the VR models a lot better. Yeah, able to yep. do a lot better training on that. And so, so that really picked up steam, and that made UVR even more popular. So, in uh, at this point, uh, this is when he started to kind of uh, he and I started to work on different methods that we could use, different processes like ensembling. That was yep, one thing. Yep. That was one. Uh, I want to explain be... explain what that that is. I mean, I, I know what it is, but it's not an obvious kind of. Uh... So it, it, when... even if you're using the online services, you would yeah. be aware that they might be being ensembled. Yeah. Yeah, true. In uh, the way the ensemble works is that basically just it's it's a way for you to use multiple models. Like if there's three or four models, you can use all of them to do the separation to get a potentially better result. Uh, there are there are three unso- There are three ways to ensemble. There's averaging, which basically just takes all the results from let's say uh, the vocal and instrumental stem and just averages them. Uh, so you're getting an average of all three. Let's say let's say we have an ensemble of three models. So you're gonna get you're gonna get an average of the three outputs that come from those three models. If you use max uh, max spec, that means that you're going to get the uh, uh, the maximum result basically from uh, f- for each stem. For each stem, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like, like yep. basically, so where uh, for example, like if you have if, if in the vocal stem, you'll notice that like if you use max spec, you'll get the uh, you'll get the heaviest weighted vocal from yeah. each model and the same yeah. thing goes for instrumental too yeah and uh you might even get cleaner instrumentals out of it but you might get more artifacts that's that's the trade-off yeah. there's always a trade-off between yeah. which yeah. one you use yeah yeah uh, and, pe- and people will will choose different different specific models that might complement each other in right. an ensemble mm-hmm. uh, you might have one that it, it is good at separating some aspects of a vocal, but not another, but you know that another model is actually a little bit better. So you, if you apply that as right. well, you kind of get the best of both worlds and average it out. Right. And, um, so yeah, it's right. a, it's a, sometimes it's an iterative process because you don't actually know how it's going to work until you've actually right. demixed it. And then you realize, ah, right. I might, if I try this model, that might improve it. And sometimes it's right. worse. Sometimes it's better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that that was a big breakthrough. I mean, the min, the min, the, the min spec and max spec were actually a big breakthrough in ensembling. Um, and Offrey was the one that that kind of like, cause I had the idea, and and then he kind of was able to help bring it to life. Um, it was actually a very simple. It was like it's like a very simple find too. It's like, oh, all we need to do is you know, I won't get into the code, but like coding wise, it, it ended up being a lot simpler than we thought, um, and and more and really effective too. So and so at this point, I was like, okay, so. Uh, uh, Boskin Dylan, who was, you know, who helped me in the GUI way in the earlier phases. Yeah, he uh, uh, he dropped out uh, because he, uh, you know, at that point, this was, I want to say late, no, mid mid twenty twenty one. Yeah, mid twenty twenty one. He dropped out because uh, uh, he he's from Austria and I think he had to do military service or something. I, I'm not exactly sure, but but he had he had personal reasons why he had to drop out. So so it was it was on me. So then the project kind of uh, the GUI wise from that point on was just on me. Um, and, uh, it's not to say that, uh, but, uh, Dylan definitely mentored me a lot and helped me and helped me understand certain coding aspects that I didn't quite understand before. And I was, and he, and he really helped me kind of like, he gave me enough information and he gave me, a, 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 a he helped me understand enough to where I was able to kind of take it and just go take my own direction on. with it. Yep. 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 And, cool. uh, and this is around the point I want to say, uh, around from mid 2021 all the way up until 2022 uh i i i was exclusively working on it now around this time um, I, I i had the, the gui was still a bit more basic it wasn't uh i hadn't had an installer for it yet um yeah. so when i when i came out with the next release uh in early 2022 i was getting a lot of complaints in github like i don't know how to install this thing i'm having trouble and because you had to go through the manual install yeah, yeah. frustrates yeah. so was like and, and like i i just i didn't have the bandwidth to keep to help everybody to help her. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. at that point. So I was like, okay, well, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make an installer for it and I'm going to try to package the whole thing together. And, uh, that's when I started to take it more seriously. And I was like, okay, all, nearly all of my free time was dedicated to UVR. Like I was just glued to, you know, that was, it was a, 
uh, I was spending like maybe 10 plus hours a day for, I want to say almost a year straight on UVR. Like I put a lot of work and effort into it at that, during this time. Um, I figured out how to package it. And then, um, I wanted to re I wanted to, to recode everything and I wanted to clean everything up because, because, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I wanted the code to be easier to maintain. So I, <clears throat> uh, so I, I put the package together, uh, the installer together, and I got help from, uh, for design, just for design, uh, boss Cortez. I, I, I that that's his screen. And, uh, he designed the new logo. He designed the new UVR logo. And, uh, he also gave me some, you know, gave me some tips. I'm like, maybe you should use these colors. I think this would make it look better. And I was just like, you know, I'm really glad I, I'm really glad I took his advice because my rich, I'm not a designer. Uh, so his, his input was, yeah, was he, great. He, like for those that don't, um, <laughs> that aren't part of the, there's a discord, um, community where UVR is, is a, is a, um, a forum on there basically and all, all of these names will if you really got into the uh, sort of people that are behind uh how the how this all progresses and moves forward all the, these names these sort of handles are the handles are in this discord community basically is that fair that's kind of how i understand yes. it anyway so yeah, yeah. Um, my handle being uh my handle being Andrew. and your handle is androck yeah 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 mm -hmm. um so just and, to, just just in case just because there's no real names behind any of this. It's kind of, I mean, yeah. there is, but it's, it's yeah. kind of yeah. like a, it's a, it's a modern kind of development kind of community. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's yeah. A it's very, development community. Yeah. Like, like, uh, like uh, for the most part, uh, I mean, uh, prior to this, nobody really knew my face. So, I mean, now they do, yeah. <laughs> but uh, at, at that point of development, when, uh, when, when, uh, he, when I say boss test, he 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 was he's the one that developed. Like I said, he's the one that de developed the logo. He developed the banner, and he kind of uh, he kind of gave me some insights on like how how the GUI should flow. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I then mean, and usability then, kind of side of it. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. like like yeah. like that's very valuable feedback. And 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 I guess that that kind of dovetails into another point that I was going to make in, in terms of uh, user feedback. Yeah. Uh, user feedback was also like the users, the early users were instrumental in making UVR what it is today too, because a lot of their feedback and a lot of their suggestions and a lot of what their thoughts were really, really helped inform um, where what I was going to take, where yeah. it became, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Because yeah. I, 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 I took all of that and I used it to make UVR better and it, and it got a lot better. Uh, so, I mean, all the, all the work that I put into it there in the early days was, uh, or I'm going to say early 2022 anyway, was, was, was based on that. And going forward, it was based on that. Um, once I released, uh, once I released the GUI version in 20, in, in mid 2022, I want to say it was, uh, I want to say it was in May, May, I released the, uh, the first insul installer for it. Like we're, we're now this is more accessible to to people who didn't quite know Python. And that was another goal I had too, because I didn't want people to have to, I wanted it to be more uh, accessible to, to people yep. who aren't, who aren't very code in programming inclined. Cause yep, not everybody's yep. not, well, not everybody's going to want to sit in front of the computer, try to figure out how to install Python and do all these other things. Yep, so, yep. so a big goal, one of my biggest goals was to make this accessible at that point. And a lot of people love the product and a lot of people uh, loved UVR and love the models, but they, they were, they, they, they didn't like the fact that they couldn't quite understand how to install it at the time. So having the installer, I think really catapulted it. And at that, and at that time, um, I had already added a new network. I added, uh, I, I added the new network, the additional networks rather. I had, this is when I added MDX net and, um, DMUX. Now I found amongst all of the, uh, networks, MDXNet is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's probably because... where most of the exciting stuff's happening at the moment as well. Yes. So. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. MDXNet. Uh, I mentioned earlier that VR only use or VR architecture only uses magnitude spectrograms, yep. not phase. Yep. Uh, MDXNet, on the other hand, uses the full spectrogram with phase and magnitude together. Yeah. So yep. you you get a slightly better separation. Now the trade-off is is that and some songs might sound uh, to some people might sound a little bit muddier, I guess. Like there might be, but but overall it sounds more natural, right? Like and it is cleaner. 
Yeah. So MDX. So so from that point on, I started basically basing my 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 sites on training just MDX net models. And at this point, our data yep. set was bigger, and and it was more representative of what of the kind of issues that it that it, that uh, we were trying to address. Yeah, just, just, just to explain what what you mean by data set, that that's kind of when the uh, I mean we we can go into how models are trained maybe a little bit, but mm -hmm. essentially the data set is what you is what you're initially training the model on in order to recognize what it is going to separate from these spectrographs yeah basically yeah, it's just... like a, it's like a i always explain it it's like it's like a sieve you're sieving out a certain type of sound and um uh how how good that sieve is is how clean the sound the, yeah so i guess kind of is that a good so analogy I guess, with, no. I guess with training um training is usually uh, there are there are several aspects of it that need to be considered if you want a good model. Yeah. Uh, data set being number one. <laughs> yeah. That's like uh, a model is only going to be as strong as as the data that you train it on. Sometimes. Yeah. So just just to, just to be clear, the 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 data set is kind of like your original stems. That yes. You're that you're training on, and you're going to mm -hmm. compare that to those stems that were mixed yeah. into a stereo mm -hmm. track. And yeah. Then you, then you can compare the effectiveness. Of right. how good your stem is out of uh, the model right. compared yeah. to what the stem originally was before it was mixed. Exactly. It, it's yeah. it's it's the it's the data set consists of official stems. Yeah, like the official yeah. 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 Like so you'll you'll so the data set has official instrumentals and official vocals in it. Like yeah. that are that are uh not AI based. They're 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 usually mixed. Um it took a long time for us. It, basically, the data set's just a lot of data that was scraped from the internet to just try to uh, yep. let that of, of vocal stems and instrumentals, and we put those together. And of course, there was also the karaoke models, which that's all free. Uh, he was the he, he was the he was the mastermind between that uh, behind that data set and those models. Um, I contributed mostly to the to the main data set for the main models, uh, <clears throat> and, but it, another uh, other aspects of it too are also. Uh, uh, you know, model size, capacity, um, the number of in and out channels in the models itself. Uh, and setting that I found to be easier in MDXNet than in VR. Um, in VR, it's like th there just wasn't enough granularity in terms of of of, of how uh, of how big or small I could make the models. I mean, there was, but not as much as MDXNet. Um, I tried training. I know that we also tried training a DMUX model too. Uh, and that one wasn't quite as successful. I, I think DMUX was more programmed to handle more stems. So I tried. So when I tried to do a dual stem uh, separator for uh, for DMU for DMUX, it, it came out. It was a decent model. It just wasn't as good as MDX or the others. It was, I would say, the weaker of the of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. But for those that don't know, the DMUX was a Facebook kind of a developer out of Facebook. Yeah, uh, AD um, uh, uh, AD Falls. Was Plus, developer, yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah. very, very, very good developer. And I think the, he, that, he was, and I still I get to a certain point a uh, uh, very usable four yeah. or six stem model. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, is part part of Ultimate Vocal Remover, and um, mm -hmm. I, I use it. Yeah, I use it. I use it all the time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's yeah. Uh, 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 Ultimate Vocal Remover uh, was all uh, wasn't able to use what I, I didn't. I didn't intend it for in the beginning. I didn't intend it to 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 be what it is today. It just kind of took, like I said, it took on a life, took a life of, its of its own. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, and at that point, I wanted it, and, and enough people were using it that I wanted it to be. My goal was to make it the uh, uh, like the Swiss Army knife of audio source exploration, right? Yeah, yeah, so that yeah. people wouldn't have to like. It, for me included, wouldn't have to like take bits and pieces from everywhere, yeah, from yeah. everywhere, and then you, you have it all in one, right? So you can, yeah. so you can also use, you know, all of the uh, official release DMUX models that are that weren't made by us. You can yeah. also load those into the or or models that other people train. You can load those into to UVR and use them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same thing goes for for MDXNet and uh, VR. Yeah, and in fact, I'll, quite a few of the models that that are used in. Uh, um, now, at least, like the reverb model, uh, the denoise model, some of those, uh, yeah, uh, those weren't trained by me. Those were actually trained by 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 the community. Yeah, yeah. and I just included. Yeah, so, we, should, we should probably mention that it's, this mm -hmm. isn't a one man or two or three man, yeah, kind of effort. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole community that kind of yeah. feeds feeds off of itself, and those models that 
not not a huge amount of people making them, but those that are making them can end up inside Ultimate Volca Remover um, because it's been designed that way that you, you can, I mean, you, you've got a repository yourself that you, you've got like a, uh, a standard set of models that come when you download it, but then you can download extra models on top of that. Um, um, so yeah, so it's, and yeah, it, I think it's quite important to stress that the, 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 um, the, mo the, the, the models, uh, are, kind of driving what you're going to do in the interface to a certain extent because there might be a feature that you can add to that interface in order to to better use that model um i guess that's coming back to what you said you you don't have to pull all this um way of working from multiple places it's it's visually all there in front of you and you say oh right well let's try this with a min min max average or uh, let's try increasing the overlap size and um it, it's very quick to just try something basically uh, yeah and you don't have to process the whole song or the whole album you can just do a slice of 20 seconds or something and right see if it works before you go for the big kind of you know process all in one go at maybe a higher yeah. resolution or whatever yeah right and yeah, yeah and i think there's a um <laughs> i'll say that those settings <laughs> The there was so much like I think one other thing too is that is that I, I've gotten so much feedback and a lot of community support. Um, I wanted to accommodate everybody and I wanted to accommodate everything. Uh, mm. That it was that was I, I guess going speaking to some of the challenges I've had with this is that since I am really when it comes to coding the GUI when it came to coding that part of it and really getting all that together I was pretty much a one man show on that yeah. part in particular. Yeah. Um, and it was hard because it's like, I, I, I because with, with projects of this magnitude of this size, usually have bigger teams behind it. Like, I mean, like yeah. bigger teams that are focused on it. Right. Like, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, like the, so, like the, 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 the GUI, you would have, uh, somebody would have just been developing the GUI and right or, maybe just or whatever so or even yeah. certain or even certain features in the gui too like somebody would yeah, be focused yeah. on like you know getting the secondary model part in there or like would be focused on getting you know uh you know would be focused on getting uh making the md uh making the mdx or integrating mdx net into it one another coder would integrate uh dmux into it right yeah. but that was that part was all me and that was yeah. i think that that kind of that kind of what uh, that was going to kind of go into one of my uh uh one of the uh, biggest challenges I had in terms of testing and uh, uh, debugging and stuff like that was probably, yeah. it was, it was stressful because I, I, I didn't want to, to release a product with bugs or anything like that. Uh, yeah. But when you are one developer doing all of those things at once, it's, it's, it's like, I kind of had to rely on the community to be my bug reporters and to be yeah, my yeah, guinea yeah, pigs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't like that. That's the part I, 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 cause I don't, I feel like I've, I've built up a certain level of trust with the community. So I want to release a product that's stable as stable as it possibly can be, but I can't test everything myself. So certain bugs are going to come up that I'm not aware of, or that I just, that are just obscure or certain issues going to come up. So, so, so I've had to release, uh, I've had to release a lot of different versions, a lot of different patches, right? And that's uh, something I've, I tried to avoid doing. And that's why there's so many patches of EVRs because um, I have to rely on the community to tell me where some of these bugs are that I'm just not going to yeah, find. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I think I think I think I mean when it's not a, it's not a okay. You you, you accept a kind of buy me a coffee kind of donation, and that does get you yeah. some extra extra models and stuff like that. But essentially, it's there's no charge for it. So I think I think no. No, I think anyone that is aware of you know how it's come about of kind of they perfectly accept that, that you know this isn't a commercial any plenty of commercial products don't bloody work any either so um they um you know but I, I must admit <laughs> i've never really had any issues with with uh dmix i mean you get the ad the odd crazy thing that might happen with the gpu um just like it would in gaming or anything but um to your credit, it's it's pretty flawless kind of operation, really. I I, um, I appreciate I, I appreciate that. I I do, <laughs> but I feel like there's this there's I, I guess maybe this is the perfectionist in me. I I want it I want it to work for everybody, 
yeah like yeah. it's seamless yeah, well, if you're perfectly. spending 10 hours a day on on this right. for a, you, you, a year or two then yeah. you are a perfectionist there's no doubt about that you, you want it um, to work for and, yeah, and, it's yeah, not, yeah. And, not, and it's not necessarily because it's not really me it's just because i mean it's more that i just i i want people to get a good experience out of it i want people to get the right i want them to be able to use it properly and uh like that's why i, exp I extended to mac uh to to making it usable on mac in fact, I, I spent a considerable amount of time, like like de devoted to uh, the Mac users, so that it would be uh, compatible, like uh, in, in being able to use the uh, uh, the the new M1, M2, M3 chips as as GPUs. Which which I'll say is, is that was one of my biggest big breakthroughs. Um, although I will say I did find that uh, it was based off of some 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 fixes that I found uh, that that a user on the Dmux uh, repo had found. And I kind of took that and I was like, oh, this is, I, I can make it, I can make the GPU on the max work. And um, that was, I think one of my, I would say one of the best breakthroughs because it made it so that you could use pretty much any model now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was, good that was, speed yeah. on max. Yeah. 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 No, no, that's, I think everyone was, mm -hmm. um, it's because of music communities, quite a, a Mac kind of centric. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. especially in the States more, probably more than in Europe, maybe to mm -hmm. a certain extent, but um, definitely yeah like DJs I mean, I, and yeah remixers yeah. and stuff yeah yeah, yeah they yeah. they use mostly at least from what i from what i see a lot of them use mac yeah, uh, yeah and yeah. even some of the videos that i've seen on youtube uh like of users talking about uvr they're on a mac so i'm like okay so yeah. i need yeah. to make sure that I, I i devote enough time on Macs to make this yeah. as usable on there as i can yeah, um, yeah. i've shared it with i mean i've come at some of the kind of dolby atmos engineers that i, I work for the mixing stuff for them but a couple of them are using it, so um, and they're on Mac, so uh, um, they're definitely, definitely happy with it. So, what, um, what? Uh, I guess we could wonder whether we should kind of um, just a, a high level kind of overview of how you would get from you got these this this data set, you got this bunch of um, tracks, um, stems. Just just give it a, a rough. It doesn't need to be specific to a mod, uh, specific architecture or whatever. Just what's the basic kind of process that is gone through to get from a, you've got this folder of data set of stems and you're going to train a model and something comes out the end of that. And that then ends up in ultimate vocal remover. How does, how does that process kind of work? Just, you know, just in layman's terms, just, just, just so somebody can understand it from a high level perspective. So, so um, you're saying like, 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 like when you put, like, are you talking about in training or, or in furnishing? Like, um, I guess the, the complete, the complete process from, um, say you, I don't know, say you, you were saying, right, I'm going to, I'm going to train a new MDX model. Oh, okay. okay. Just, just, just a basic kind of overview uh, I, of how that happens. There's and a lot of and equipment you've got to use and stuff like, you know, the GPUs and stuff. I, I now use a, uh, I guess, GPU-wise, I'll start with the hardware. Right yeah. now, I use a, an A6000 uh, yeah. NVIDIA GPU. It's got a lot more VRAM. It's got 48 yeah. gigs of VRAM. Yeah. yeah. So that that, that kind of helps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I have a, uh, I think it's a 58, an X5800 Ryzen, uh, Ryzen yeah. CPU. You want to have a decent yeah. CPU, too, I think. It, uh, and... Uh, I have 128 gigabytes of system RAM. Yeah. Not sure if you need that much, but I, I have it anyway. You got it, yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to have a lot of hard drive storage um, to handle, depending on how big your data set is. So I have a, and you want to have like an, I have an NVMe uh, four terabyte, which is definitely big enough and fast because you want to have a, an SSD, definitely an SSD. Don't, don't yeah. use a, just, just, just to make it clear to everyone, yeah. there's a huge amount of files that are getting processed here. It's not just, it's not just an album of music. This is yeah, it's hundreds a lot of and data. possibly thousands of thousands. individual yeah. stems, stems, mm -hmm. and that's that's just to get to a model. Yeah, just to get a decent usable, model. Just to get a decent yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. You, you can get like you can get rudimentary models or 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 um, more specialized models with smaller data sets, like you know, like that are in the lower hundreds, right? Like 200, I would say you want to keep your minimum at about 200, at least have 200 samples of something. Rather, rather you're making a, a, a karaoke data set, a crowd data set, or, or a reverb data set, right? Like you want to have at least minimum 200 if you want some good, decent results, right? Anything under that, you might not get the results that you want. Um, anything over that, you'll get better results. 
Uh, and then from there, you also want to consider, uh, I guess, from 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 the training perspective, uh, how big you want your model to be. Uh, I know that uh, in the training process for MDXNet, you can choose the FFT size, how big, how the resolution uh, of the spectrogram, yeah, yeah well, yep. how big you want that to be. Uh, yep. That's considered uh, yep. the internet, the in and out channels of a model. That's how uh, you want to set, which is basically the the, the size of the channels. And okay. Yeah. I won't get I won't get too granular into that part just because it's that it, it's a lot and and I don't even fully understand it the way that I want to, uh, right. but I understand it enough because I don't want to I don't want to speak on something I don't understand as well as I should, but um but I, I know that that's you, you want to increase the the if if you want to uh, uh, at least if you have the hardware yeah the larger the bigger the the model capacity is the more resource intensive it's going to be. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so you also have to kind of balance that too. So, if you have a smaller data set, you, your your model capacity doesn't have to be as large, because if you have a large model capacity, like if like if you make the model capacity too large with a small data set, you're going to run the risk of um, overfitting. The model will overfit on just that data set, and overfitting basically means that the model or the model is only going to learn the features of that data set too well that it's not going to be able to generalize and learn the and understand uh, how to pull. Uh, the data it's supposed to from from, from other other un, songs, un, yeah. unknown songs, yeah, yeah that's never yeah, seen yeah. before, right? Yeah. So right. so so large model capacity, small data set will result in a overfitting, but a a small model capacity with a large data set is going to result in it not really learning much at all because it's not, it's going to basically forget the features yeah. of a larger yeah. data set. It's not going to work well. So you kind of want to balance those two things out well, right? You yeah. Wanna have, yeah. And you also want to uh, batch size is also something else you want to consider. Batch size is the amount of samples that are be being fed into the model as it's being trained. Smaller batch sizes are going to take longer to learn. It's going to uh, uh, larger batch sizes are it, longer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> smaller batch sizes are going to make the model is going to make the model take longer to learn. But you might get a slightly better result at the end. Uh, larger batch sizes, it the model might not learn as well because it's having to learn bigger batches at once, uh, but the model will train faster. Uh, so you also have to kind of balance that out too. So so ha kind of having to fine tune and tweak those settings, I think is kind of key in understanding what works for your data set, what works for whatever model you're training. I know that I've had to kind of balance out because I know the ma vast majority of UVR's users don't have these big beefy GPUs, right? A lot of them, some yeah. of them are even using, are still using CPU, right? So I kind of want to still accommodate for that. Right, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So I don't want to make the model so large that they that they can barely run it. Like MDX twenty three C is our, our our largest larger models with yeah. the bigger capacity sizes, and those are very resource intensive. And yep. a lot of users complain that they that while the model is very good, it's very slow, even on decent GPUs. Like yeah, yeah. like 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 a like a like a like a lower end uh, like a thirty forty right or I'm sorry a thirty fifty. Yeah, yeah. Right, like which is. Newer, but it's 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 uh, it's still going to be slower because it doesn't have as much VRAM and all that other stuff. <clears throat> and and then of course the users that are using AMD, which I recently expanded usage to AMD uh, GPUs and uh, Intel Arc using OpenCL. Uh, <clears throat> and and those are going to be a little bit slower, just in general, I'm faster than a CPU, but a little slower than what a NVIDIA will give you. <clears throat> but so so if I want to I wanted to accommodate for that too in terms of the models that I make. Uh, the model that I'm training now, that it, that I'm going to be coming out with sometime in the next couple of weeks or so, uh, is 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 a little smaller, uh, but better than the uh, best regular MDXNet model that I have. So, and uh, the idea was is I wanted to make the model a little smaller just so that it could be uh, more usable. So it's not so it doesn't take so 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 it's not as resource intensive. Uh, so yeah, those are usually the uh, uh, those are the in terms of training, those are the things that that's kind of what goes into it. And um, for me, uh, typically, if you, depending on how large your data set is to my, uh, if I have like 3000 samples of like uh, average song lengths of like, you know, four minutes, three minutes, it's going to take, <clears throat> it's going to take at least, uh, you know, uh, with a batch size of, let's say, batch size of eight, uh, about a, Maybe a month and a half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's all people know. Don't, people don't appreciate it. that's what one very very powerful GPU running for a month and a half continually just to get the model at the end of it. And this is why um, it's not. I mean, it, I guess the 
process is relatively simple to get into because a lot of the back end stuff's kind of already done in yeah um you know because it, it, it's the same ai that's uh training that's been used for various things but um yeah and and, and i and i think one thing i want to mention too is that uh i i want to give credit where credit's due it's like because MDXNet was made by a group of very talented developers in Quilab from the University of Korea. Like yeah. that was their baby. They they did an like it's my favorite network. So I, if they're watching, they did an amazing uh-huh. job. <laughs> Making that, Actually, they like, will be. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're uh, uh, Wu Song Chi. I think his name is. I, I I've I've not interacted with him a whole lot, but um, yeah, I'm a big yeah. fan of his work. He did a great job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, MD- to, for for those that aren't aware of. Kind of these terminologies, this like the MDX, especially the MDX twenty three stuff yeah. is extremely good at vocal Very separation. Good. It's ex- mm-hmm. it's to, on the right track. It can be almost as usable as a a pure stem that's just come straight from the, the yeah. Sheet. Um. So yeah, I can Yeah, no doubt you you. Well, I think everyone's impressed impressed by it. And um, yeah. I, you know, I, I and, it, in, and it will do a better job than most of the commercial stuff out there. I agree. Um, now, uh, now, don't get me wrong. I think that Lala is good. I think a lot of what see. I think a lot of what's coming out now. I'm excited about it. Like, I the personally, I I want to keep UVR free always, forever. Like, I don't ever, I don't ever plan on monetizing it. Like, like making it commercial. Basically, it's always going to be open source. I, that was that was the. Uh, I I want this to be accessible to everybody. And I also want to encourage other companies to like to to make this process better. Like, so I'm glad that that services like Well and Moises exist because it's like I, I, I'm I'm excited to see what type of breakthroughs that they'll come out with. And uh, and then there was another one. Uh, it's uh, it Audio Shake. Um, audio Shake. Yeah, that's the one shake. I was thinking about. Audio Shake. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see what they come out with. I'm excited to see how they how they improve this technology because right now I think the biggest yeah. biggest hurdle. Is phase, <laughs> right. um, that's what's that right there is what's per, it, that's what I, part of what's causing the muddiness. I mean, really, it's it's also it, it's 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 uh, finding a better way altogether. But but right now in source separation, there's not a very there's not a, a, a great way to calculate phase in a model. Like it's like the phase spectrograms because they're yeah. they're they're not as obvious as uh, as a magnitude, magnitude spectrogram is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. because magnitude, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna. This is almost leading into um, your like demudding yes. process that we've mm-hmm. we've discussed about as well. So, yeah, um, that's... Uh, so for I guess the easiest way to describe demudding is you're kind of taking. This is my very crude <laughs> explanation of it. You're doing a much better job uh, than me, Anthony. But you essentially, when you take, for example, you take the vocal out of a heavy rock track. Some of that vocal will pull some of that instrumental kind of with it simply because the process is not perfect and there's a kind of like a an overlapping identical um phase, I guess would you would yes, call it? Yes, yeah. Like basically it's like because because they can't right now source separation cannot calculate phase as accurately as I wish it could. Is that yeah. there there's there's gonna be some uh there's going to be some some even if you hear a vocal track, like 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 let's say the vocal stem, you're yep. not going to hear the instrumental in there. But there is instrumental data in there in the yeah. phase of that vocal track. That, it's that like the, son- sonically, it's exactly almost exactly the same. Mm-hmm. So the model kind of some of it might have stayed with the instrumental, but some mm-hmm. of that instrumental went with the vocal. Yeah, um, it's not a perfect separation because at the end of the day, source separation does prediction. It's predicting where it yeah. thinks it is, and in that, and it's not always going to be accurate. So there's yeah. going to be those imperfections that are going to show whenever you hear a, a muddier sound. Yeah. Like I said, with yeah. with with the track that has more noise, like metal tracks, it, yeah. that's usually the best example I can give because they have the most noise. Yeah. So well, that, that's so the example you gave when on yeah, the one that you exactly. shared, which is the small mm-hmm. kind of I don't know, ten seconds. Length. It was a small ten, yeah. ten, yeah. ten, ten second clip from from a from, from a from a, a hard rock artist. So yeah. it was easier for me to kind of for me to 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 show uh, to show that difference. Yeah. Now, yeah. now the demudding technique that I use is not one that I think. I don't think anyone uses. I I kind of I I could be wrong. Maybe someone else has thought about it. But uh, to get to kind of go into the more details of it is it's kind of hard to explain. But I'm going to do my best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, so because a big part of the problem is phase. 
I use a lot of I use a lot of phasing tricks. I basically take it. It processes the it processes the track twice. The first go around, it takes the instrumental, the output instrumental from from that first from that first go around, and it it compares it against the original mixture. And what it does is it is that it it chop it it chops up the it chops the the uh, the mixture into chunks into like three second chunks, uh, and it iterates over each over 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 the that that list of chunks, and for each segment, it cuts out where that segment is in the instrumental, right. <laughs> and it finds similar events that aren't at the exact same place. I I I said this yeah. one. You'd be easy to explain. No 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 no. You'd <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's it. I, I know you've tried. Well, no, you've tried. You have explained it, and it's yeah. not an easy thing to get around because it's almost going right. It's like three I, I, it's like a three dimensional kind of pitch you got to get in your head. Right. Yeah. It's it's like the, yeah. the code is all there. It's it's like and and, I, and it's uh it's like I I wish I had a flow chart. I should have made one to show you. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of explain this, but I guess I'm trying to give a, a higher level explanation of it. Basically, what it does is it takes those chunks and and and, and it and it analyzes them against the instrumental that was generated. And it tries to find the most similar events it can, and from the instrumental that aren't at the same place and from from that segment, and it it finds those similar events and then it phases it. It does a a, a, a phase invert of that instrumental, and then if the if it reach if 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 the uh, uh, if the Volume or dB threshold isn't past a certain point because if it's too loud, then it's it it means it's it it's not it doesn't uh, uh it doesn't cancel out some of the audio invert. that's there. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. phase invert. Yeah. Um, if it reaches a certain threshold, like like if it's below a certain threshold, it'll phase that. Yeah. And then it will, and then it will basically stitch together a new mixture that is ah right yeah it stitches together a new mixture that's kind of phased from that from that uh original instrumental uh output yeah yeah that, and it and it and, and and then it reprocesses that new stitch together mixture with with that that's with with the phase with the instrument with the instrumental phase changed yeah and it takes it processes that through, through the second pass, and then it takes that vocal and then face inverts it with the mixture, with the original mixture. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, and what you end oh. up having is you end up having some of the parts that were similar from the from the other parts of the track. You end yeah. up having those fill in the the spectral holes, so to speak. Yeah. Is it so? Right? It, 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 oh, yeah. There are kind of some quite crude spectral hole fillers where it that's kind of is what it's doing i think it's um yeah i think there's one in um there's probably one in like isotope rx but the one i've i'm aware of is in um uh stereo tool it's called it's um yeah so it, it, but that's that's really just taking a whole kind of yeah. section and of this sounds exactly like that section there mm -hmm. and it kind of yeah. just, it's just yeah, a cut, yeah. cut, cut and paste but you you're yeah. actually you're kind of iteratively Looking yeah, it, elsewhere in the spectrograph to mm -hmm. spectrogram to get that that similar. You try. I'm trying to get a similar part, right? But I'm also yeah. trying to. But I'm trying to take that similar part and phase it with the uh, uh, with that segment. Yeah, and yeah. because it's not the exact same part of the of 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 the segment that's being, it's yeah. not going to be like a perfect phase, right? Like, like yeah, because I don't want it to be. Because if it is, and you're just getting the vocal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like 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 the, like the original vocal. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, output. You're trying to find the the bit of the instrument that is still in the vocal. Is that right? Yes. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Kind like of. Yeah. yeah. And I uh, one uh, I'll probably show a better example. Uh, maybe uh, what I'll do is offline. I'll I'll send you some more examples that maybe you can show in maybe your next podcast. That'd be you know, great. Right? Yeah. That yeah. way you can kind of, because I, the explanation I'm giving is not. Uh, yeah. No. It, 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 it's it's very it's very hard to explain that process. Yeah, uh, it's it's almost better that I show it. But and, I think it's just um, safe to say that the community it's very, when, very you did, when you did when you did share that, a lot of people got quite excited because it's very they, effective. They knew that it was a a step kind of progress in the. It's a step um, in the right direction. In the, yeah, in a because mm -hmm. it no matter how well it, it separates when you kind of uh, A and B between the. 
the original stereo track mm -hmm. and then you null out what the vocal um is removed you know that from the from the stereo track there's kind of there's always that slight especially in the kind of more in like the cymbals and hi-hat sort of end you can yeah kind mm -hmm. of hear it a bit kind mm -hmm. of just sounds like it's dropped in level a little bit and i guess right. that's what you you're that's what I'm trying to, to address. I'm yeah, trying to address yeah. the the issue where it sounds muddy and it sounds like that there's kind of washed out. Yeah. Now it's it the the process is not perfect, right? Like there's still things that I'm still working out with it, but it's because the main goal was to make was to make sure that the audio stayed sounding natural. I didn't want to sound smeared like what you get from the VR models. I wanted to sound natural and I wanted it to sound official and fuller and brighter. That would that was the idea. And I didn't want to compromise the vocal stem quality at all, right? I didn't want to make sure that that, that remained. Uh, in fact, if anything, I wanted to make that. I wanted to make the vocal stem quality better, which it does in some cases. Right. But it also depends on the way th that the track was mixed originally. So, oh yeah, yeah. If it's an analog track that was recorded in one in one session, right? Or or let's say if it's a a live track, even yeah, yeah. the the demutter that I have or the process that I have isn't going to work as well with tracks like that. I have a plan B for those, right? Like, like for demudding, but it's but but if it's a, but if it's a continuous recording, it's not because the, because there's there's not going to be there there's not going to be phase similarities on you know at 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 five seconds into the track compared to where compared to like you know ten or a minute in, right? Like there's not going to be other parts for it to really pull from that are exact that match phase, right? Because because it's it's a live recording. It's like, but if you have but if the track was mixed, uh, but if the track was mixed with samples. Like 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 continuous sample loops, like a, a lot of mixers do that. And if the track is digital, it'll be you'll you'll the likelihood of you getting a successful demud is going to be much or a better result from the demud yeah. is going to be higher. Right? Yeah, I don't think so, that's kind of true across uh, most separations. Is the the new uh, um, sometimes it can it depends on how heavy it's been limited. I find sometimes, but generally. The older analog stuff is harder to separate than sometimes it is, yeah. Cleaner digital, but it, sometimes it's, it's not. all in it's, how it's been yeah. processed. Mm -hmm. It's all how it's been mastered. I yeah. guess to some extent. I I notice oddly, uh, in in some older tracks, like you know, like from track from like the seventies, uh, yes. or or early eighties, like they're surprising. They they separate well. Uh, yeah. I think it's, I, I think it's more in terms of the the, the, the way that the demutter works specifically is that it won't be it won't work as well on tracks like that, but um. I think when you get to older tracks, like like when you get to like the early '60s, uh, like '50s, where it's really old, like older tracks that were originally recorded in mono, uh, those might be a little harder. Like AI will have a little bit of a harder time with those. Uh, but whenever you start getting into like the stereo era, early stereo era, it starts getting a little better. Uh, <clears throat> but there there are still, like I said, there are there are still drawbacks to it. Like I'm 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 wanting to, and the reason why I'm taking my time with the demutter is because I. It's because I, I see the promise in it, and it's 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 it works really well with a lot of tracks. That there are some tracks it doesn't quite work the way I want it to yet, and I don't want to release it. I, I would hate to release it or put it in. I would hate to put it into a patch and have a whole group of people love it, and then people say, "Oh, it didn't work for these tracks. It sucks." Right? Yeah. I, I I want it to work well for everybody first, um, yeah, and I'm yeah. getting I'm getting there. I think it's just, I, I I make more breakthroughs the more time I spend on it. Lately, it's been harder for me to spend as much time on UVR because you know my day oh, job. You've been, you've been busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they no. they got me back at the office at my day job. So it's like I'm, <laughs> yeah, so there's a. <clears throat> So I, I, there, there's some, there's some time constraints that have prevented me from being able to spend as much time. And then there's other things in my personal life, I'm, you know, that I, I have to deal with that's makes yeah. it, make it hard for me to spend as much time. So, no, 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 I mean, that's, um, very much appreciate you making the time to, to come on the podcast because it's yeah. uh, definitely somebody that I've wanted to speak to. Yeah. Um, just because I use the tool, just because I use the tool so much. Um, you know, I'm definitely proud of the work that we've done. Like that, I've, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm. I'm Definitely one of my uh, one of my crowning achievements, I would say. Like in terms, like really, it, it, it's. Uh, I'm proud of where it's come. I'm proud of where it's where it's the. I'm proud of the fact that every. I'm proud of how felt how, how far I got with it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, considering I'm, you weren't necessarily a, a developer kind of starting right. point, you've yeah, you've you've, you've not only have you learned quite a complex. Um, part of community of computing such as AI, you've actually had to teach yourself everything around that to build a GUI and 
Um, okay, you've had help along the way, but um, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I, I couldn't have gotten here without the help, right? Like yeah, there yeah. was like like without without Boss and Dylan to kind of help lay out the foundation in the beginning, without Offrey to kind of help with the data data sets and the uh, um, <clears throat> and and his input and his his expertise and the community and Boss Cortez developing the logo and also other. The, the, the community giving its feedback, UVR would not be what it is today without that. And there's a lot of other things that I that I really hope to implement in the future. Like obviously the demoter is going to be in there in the next iteration. Um, I'd like to get translations in there because I I, I know that they have a big international community, <laughs> like a lot of foreign users that don't speak English. I I would really like to get a translation feature in there. Um, I would also like to get like, I, and I also like to make it more accessible for people who are who are you know visually impaired because I've I've gotten a lot of uh, there's been a lot of issues on GitHub open for that. So there's a lot of other little things I'm trying to address. It's just that just finding the time to do all that stuff has been difficult. But I'm really proud of how far it's come, and I'm really glad that I've I, I, I'm glad that it's it, it's gotten to where it is now. And I no, I'm thankful be. for the community and for everything. No, no, you should be very proud. It's uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's such a cool product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, and I, I, I think, um, yeah, I think it's still a lot of people that are gonna discover it as well. I don't, mm -hmm. okay, there's that community on, um, on the Discord is, I don't know where there's five thousand odd members there, Quite which a bit, is a yeah. lot more, which a lot more than you'd ever think for something like this. But mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a really active community. Um, uh, just people that are just trying, trying to get a vocal separated just for kicks. But then people that you know, like myself, which are doing it as a you know, almost as a, a service to the audio industry as well, yeah. Um, and everyone's kind of using this tool, so you're definitely um, you're definitely ticking the right boxes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I've I've tried, uh, and uh, and I, I hope that it gets. Yeah, I hope that it continues to get better. Like I hope that I can I can continue. I hope new breakthroughs are made in the industry that are that make it better. Yeah, I hope yeah. that they. I hope that they come out with more phase aware AIs um, mm. that I can implement, so that like I don't. <laughs> I don't want to have to use a demutter. <laughs> no. I'd like for that to not have to be a thing that yeah. like I I I want the demutter to become obsolete. Like at yeah. some point, that would yeah. be nice. And but, I hope that uh, yeah. that happens. I think it probably will do because um, I don't. I mean, I don't. Maybe there is a like this ceiling that won't you won't be able to get past it. But I imagine it. Yeah. Every moment in time, people think there's this ceiling that can't be broken, and it nearly always is. But um, but I just looking at like SDR figures from two or three years ago to mm -hmm. to now, um, mm -hmm. you got like the bike dance way and up. stuff like that, and mm -hmm. it's just continually progressing. Just for everyone that doesn't know what the SDR is, I keep referring to that's the signal to uh, noise distortion ratio. So it's kind of the it's what the model didn't, or how much of the original stem did the model separate against against itself, kind of thing. So it's kind of like um, it's the it's the residue that the lower the residue, the higher that percentage, basically. But it doesn't always mean that it sounds clearer. It, it might just be that it it's it, it's effective at separating it. But it it's weird. Sometimes the lower SDR actually sounds better than the yeah higher SDR. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. yeah. It, it, it SDR is a great metric. It, it, it is a great metric to kind of see what what direction the model's going in. But and, gen and generally, if it's good at mm -hmm. vocal separation, the inversion of the vocal will create a good instrumental right. or might create a good drum stem yeah. or whatever. So, it, I think the best the best metric is user feedback because sometimes it's like I, I've no, I, I've heard high SDR models, like some of the highest ones like will fail at certain at certain points where like where it like it'll it won't remove the vocals where it's supposed to or like so so SDR is a very good metric it's a good place to start but it's it's uh there there there's also the the human aspect of it well, the perception that should be kind of side of the it, perception yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but the, but the SDRs have gotten much higher over the years i think that like um mm. i think my early models were like were somewhere in like the 13 10 9 <laughs> point something yeah. right and now it's like at 16 point something right so it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's 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 gotten much higher and, totally. and that's kind of atmospheric would be anything over 20 like that eventually i hope that they get above that and mm. um, no. and hopefully that'll be representative of of less muddiness right that's yeah, ultimate, yeah. 
that's what I care about the most is the muddiness. It's like if we can get a model that sounds natural and less muddy, mm. that's that's yeah. kind of been my primary focus. Yeah, no, I think I think I think that's um yeah, I think I think it's uh it's a step that is gonna it probably won't bridge to a overall cleaner model, but you will mm -hmm. learn or everybody will learn along the way if it's open source what what you've done there and that you know, it's just feed, gonna feed into itself like any other kind of um yeah. technology progress. So yeah. Um no, chapeau to you, Anthony. It's um it's great to have oh, we've kind of <laughs> Michael's it's there, a, silent in the background at the moment. Yeah, but. it's a, it's a kind of you know people <laughs> usually make people usually make fun of me because I talk so much in a strange accent that nobody understands. Um, but this was absolutely this was absolutely mesmerizing. I, I was kind of listening quietly and fascinated. You know, kind of uh, it's it's always it's always fun to see uh, people who really have an extremely deep understanding about the things that they do, and especially if they if they give back to the community in a way that you do. That 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 was absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. That that was that was absolutely that was fun. Thank you so much for being on on this Appreciate podcast. It. This uh, this this was this was outstanding. Okay, so this was Anthony. This was this was absolutely great. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the news of this month, uh, Sam. There were a couple of things, and we probably should kind of say that we are recording this podcast at the end of January, even though it goes live in the middle of February. So while we're recording that, NUM is just taking place. Um, so there are certain yeah. things that we know and other things that uh, are going to happen be between the time of recording and the actual time of release of this podcast that we do not know yet. So if we are missing something, uh, uh, don't get upset. We didn't know about those things yet. No. And I have a couple of lists of uh, items here that I found interesting. And the most interesting thing to me, at least, that, that happened over the last couple of uh, days was the release of the Audient Aura, Aura Adobe Atmos audio interface. Um, I, th I think this is something that was really missing in the entire Adobe Atmos space. Um, you know, kind of especially for people that are like us, uh, a little bit on the home producer, bedroom producer side. Uh, an option to have like uh, one unit that can do it all. The uh, Audient Aurea uh, interface is can be used as an interface or as a monitor controller. And uh, it uh, essentially does everything. So it has 16, I think it has 16, Sam, right? 16 analog outs. And, yeah. uh, and then essentially you can also run uh, Sonarworks on it. So it does all the things that you need. So th this, is, this is actually brilliant. And, and, and if, you're, if I'm not mistaken, it is about uh, 3,000 bucks, right? Uh, was it was it like like yeah, like yeah yeah, yeah that, that that sounds about right yeah I mean it's kind of yeah it's kind of taken a lot of the challenges that you face in a multi-channel um, studio um, and kind of wrap them all into a single piece of hardware I guess um, uh, yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's sort of on our Discord server, and by the way, um, in that link, uh, I'm going to post it somewhere. Uh, on our Discord server, we have the discussion actually quite often that people come into the Discord and uh, they want to know how can we produce Dolby Atmos, how can we set up a Dolby Atmos studio at home, uh, and how can we do that in a cost-effective way. And uh, that, that is always a challenge because you need, uh, so far, you needed multiple devices. There was not a single... Uh, interface uh, that had 16 outs. Actually, that's not completely yeah. true. There was one, but that was very, really difficult to get. Uh, and and this now is the first really commercial one. So I'm really excited. Um, I was actually kind of uh, in the process of building a Dolby Atmos Studio myself. Uh, people don't know, but I essentially my my video space here is actually very, very small and it's stereo only. And I was in the process of uh, converting my basement when the pandemic hit and I had to stop everything. And kind of this is probably going to restart my, my, my thing because now essentially you can do a Dolby Atmos Studio below ten thousand bucks, which uh, which uh, is is actually kind of uh, is, is yeah. substantial. But it, it would work. It would probably work for lower order ambisonics as well. I would have thought. Um, oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't really look at it from that perspective, but I'm assuming. I mean, it is completely. It is uh, from from what I've agnostic. seen. It is completely. Yeah, it is to some extent agnostic. So essentially, kind of, uh, but it is completely. Well, I mean, it's it's sort of it has sixteen outs, right? So, so yeah. um, you can obviously kind of feed an ambisonic signal and convert it into a sixteen-channel audio. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so so that that I think um, we will see essentially if that makes uh, an impact. Um, that once again, I think opens up the the space to many people who did not had have, have access uh, to to Adobe yeah. Atmos just because of the complexities of setting that up. Yeah. 
Okay, so so the the, the second thing, uh, or is there anything else we we should talk about in terms of the Aurea? Uh, probably not. Uh, I haven't had a chance <laughs> because of because of uh, Nam Twenty Four. A lot of stuff has all come out. There's there's a there's a lot of stuff. In forty eight hours and. Uh, or it seems like 48 hours. Yeah, essentially kind of, I think at the time we are recording this, there was another news release by Sony or something. So it's, it's sort of, ah, it's, right. it's coming out as we speak because yep. NAM is taking place as we're recording this. Yep. Yep. Uh, the second thing and that actually happened like uh, two weeks ago was uh, DVR Pro kind of got an update to version two. Uh, it now has a couple of additional capabilities. Uh, it used to be, for those of you kind of uh, who don't know that that is a kind of a panning tool that allows you to pen audio sources into multi-channel. And uh, it's a fairly popular one, especially by people who are working with Dolby Atmos. And uh, it used to be a mono only, so you can only you could only kind of pen a mono source into, into multi-channel, but now it is stereo. And it also has an additional little application that allows you to add a head tracking uh, device. It used to be that you needed the Spatial Audio Connect, which was a kind of a VR application that you could run in a virtual reality environment. And uh, they now kind of added a little application that does not need a VR headset. So you can actually use like for, I think I think they have a video on their site where they show how to use the sub of your head tracker. Had, had track about it. I mean, I'm also not completely sure. We talked before we recording, we recorded that we talked about that a little. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of a head tracker in a pen in a pen is, but uh, <laughs> but uh, and, 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 and many people got actually quite excited about that. Yeah. Uh, have you have you have you tried Sam? Have you ever tried kind of that that uh, DVR Pro? Uh, I I do use it. Um, I I. I used it more before I had a Dolby Atmos renderer because of Windows based. The Dolby yeah. Atmos side came oh, yeah, yeah, came later. Yeah. So when I was messing it, because it, it can do ambisonics as well, DVR, I think, if I remember. It, 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 well, I I, I'm, not, I'm honestly not sure about the version yeah. number one, but but the second version can do um, ambisonics, yes. It yeah. Can. Um, and uh, yeah, initially I was kind of just, as I was exploring spatial audio, that's one of the, well, like we were saying before we came on on air the um it's one of the earlier kind of multi-channel panners that you could buy um commercially um and it and has it, a, it has a it has a full room simulation so so in in, in addition to a reverb there's also reflections yeah. and you can ch change the room sizes so for somebody who is yeah. sort of coming from a virtual reality space that is very enticing because uh, essentially allows you to simulate kind of really really yeah. spaces yeah i mean you can put it on each kind of mono or stereo track or stem and um yeah use it use it like a a, a panel that you would in in atmos today um so and, yeah and and the reality really is, is starting to make a big impact in the music space uh you know kind of we were talking uh, bef before we started recording also kind of i just got the sennheiser 490s, which are the new centers, which are excellent, by the way. And and they come with a mixed version of DVR. Um, so um, DVR, or DVR Reality is the company, DVR is the product. Uh, they're, they're really kind of trying hard to become kind of a staple in the spatial audio space, or even more of a staple in the spatial audio space. A lot of people already like it anyway. Then another thing that came out yesterday, actually, the day before the recording, uh, that was the Immerse Virtual Studio for Apple Music. You, you, you are Windows only, Sam, right? I I have a Mac as well, but for music, it's Windows only. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's big because unfortunately, that that essentially requires a yeah. Mac, and that actually requires <laughs> one with. And I actually didn't know that uh, that requires an Apple Silicon Mac. The uh, sort of the the uh, Apple Music head yeah. tracking apparently only works on on apple silicon or at least kind of the uh yeah. the, the 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 application program interface that they provide yeah uh, this sounds like it's mirroring the um what's the company audio movers plugin yeah the, the audio movers and then essentially the, the the second one that came out was uh ginger audio with the uh, ground uh -huh. control sphere where they had the i render plugin Ah, yeah, where, sorry, where, yeah, where I did one, yeah. a little video and then people got confused because uh, Ginger Audio actually does not say that you need an Apple Silicon Mac, they just ah. say Mac. <laughs> right. uh, and it actually turns out that uh, that is not so. If, if yeah. you're purchasing ground controls for you, make sure that you try it first because <laughs> their marketing material is not complete. Um, yeah. uh, so, so kind of that, that and that, that's, that's interesting actually. Um, 
Uh, no, I, I'm, I, I used Immerse, uh, Embody, Embody is the company, Embody Immerse uh, um, a little bit. It's, it's actually a pretty good one. What I was missing so far was the head tracking. And, and this now with Apple Music is, is in there. So you can actually use um, a kind of head tracking. That, that, that is nice. Um, yep. And, and with, the, with that, Kat, I, I, was, I think that was mentioned on our Discord server. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I can't remember exactly what the source was, were, but, was, was, but there, was, there is an update to the Apple Music payout. Apparently, if you are releasing your music uh, in, uh, with special audio, you are getting a higher payout now, Sam. Do you yeah. remember how that was? Yeah, so uh, it's all a bit complex how the payout works, but this is the percentage of the percentage that the artist would get i think that's how i understood it so there's uh it it's there's, it's like there's, there's kind of there's the artist there's a label and there's probably a rights owner to most music um sometimes it, i guess it could all be the same yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yeah exactly if you're if yourself if yourself yeah. uh, uh kind of releasing usually yeah. you are the same but i think for the level of um a musician that is gonna see a change in that 10 percent you're going to be the higher kind of um streaming type artist going into the millions of streams i'd have thought um but yeah it's obviously an incentive to uh, i guess for more for back catalog because a, a lot of modern stuff seems to be mixed more in uh, dolby atmos or sony 360 um so a lot of a but lot there's, of there's a huge there's a huge amount of back catalog. Well, yeah, the demixing is is a big a lot topic. of demixing will be necessary. That's a big big topic at the moment. Um, yeah. So and vocal, uh, vocal separation because yeah, I mean we didn't really touch on this, um, Anthony, but uh, the the a lot of the time the the multi track or the stems aren't origin aren't available um, either the especially in the analog days they might have recorded over the. Yeah. analog tape in order to save money because they were a new band at the time they didn't have the money to buy multiple tapes mm -hmm. so they they literally recorded one track and then recorded yeah. the next track over it and just bounced it to wherever it was going to be um mastered or whatever uh so so yeah sometimes there's uh, might be political reasons where the manager's got the rights but they can't get hold of the stems because he's not releasing them all sorts of stuff like that goes on so they call it they lack the assets that's what the engineers call it so there's it's basically trying to like um yeah do a do a spatial mix but you've only got a stereo source is um uh, that you can up mix to a certain extent where you're just literally just spreading that stereo source out to the multiple speakers mm -hmm. around you um yeah but you've really limited by just frequency splitting or maybe loudness splitting and stuff like that you can't really say oh, i want the guitar to go over here and i want yeah. a vocal over there which is kind of what my demix me um service comes in is i try and give them the the stems to separate it out more yeah because um, so, uh, with each stem you get uh because with each stem like uh like if you use like demix to, to get four stems right like you see yeah each stem has the two channels too that you can kind of re that you can re kind of rebalance to get a better spatial mix too. I would assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I generally some oh, well, as you know, sometimes if it's more in the left channel, mm -hmm. um, sometimes you might be able to separate the stereo uh, left and right into two stems. So you might have yeah. a bass in the right channel and a uh, a vocal in the left, and that would allow mm -hmm. you to split it. Um, but it's surprising how even though it's it's not a perfect separation yeah um because it's all played collectively back and uh, some models even null back to the stereo if you combine them all yeah. it's essentially this it's a non-destructive separation so um so in the atmos space you can get away even though it's not perfect you can pan stuff around mm -hmm. um and separate it out of the stereo field because it's clean enough that it the brain doesn't notice that it's yeah. not a perfect mm -hmm. not a perfect separation. So yeah. Yeah. So um I think yeah, possibly with this Apple music payout change there's yeah I can't, so definitely uh, back uh, definitely back catalog is going to be back catalog. I, I was like i was sorry, actually, go on, Andrew. Yeah. sorry Andrew. <laughs> no, i was just going to say if, if you're getting all the if, if even if this even if the audio was separated if you're getting it from all spaces you won't notice the subtle imperfections from the separation totally. itself yeah 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 oh, and even yeah. the the process of encoding it to a lossy mm -hmm. format yeah is artifact to you they'll they'll rob um it's almost like a spectral 
kind of separation where they'll borrow mm -hmm. um they'll reduce the file size down of mm -hmm. the stream by essentially taking the stuff that you're not really going to yeah. notice that they've taken out but when you solo that speaker it's artifact it sounds like old mp3 yeah. kind of playing but collectively it, it, it all comes back together and sounds normal again so exactly yeah, yeah. and you can get away with that in the demixing sort of style as well because it's yeah it's all going to null back to the stereo essentially so exactly as long as you don't yeah. literally pan it out of place entirely it, it, it spatializes quite well anyway yeah so that's, I mean, i'm kind uh, of I'm, I'm kind of curious i think you talked about that at the, at the i think it was the very first episode a little bit um if there's sort of a market developing for uh um, studios or kind of institutions that have sort of these collections and i'm, I'm, I'm thinking for our own um university we, you know kind of philadelphia had a very active music scene in the second half of the 20th century and when the studios went bust our university got all the recordings and we have a huge collection of uh, essentially four track recordings mm -hmm. um some some very famous ones um and i'm kind of curious if, if sort of if there's like a market developer going for for people that are kind of taking these because four four tracks obviously are not enough right so you so you want to actually kind of separate it out even further um Mm. Uh, is, is there is, is there development in that area is this is this apple movement to kind of push the idea that uh, you need to provide special audio in order to get a higher payout is that, is that kind of fostering people to actually look into that to go back into their catalog into the original kind of master tapes and and try to recreate something with higher track counts well i, th I, well, I think to a certain extent that they have to if they haven't got the 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 assets the the stems but they want to take advantage of of a higher payout from apple so um to a certain extent they're gonna they're gonna find ways to, uh, the, the problem is that just up mixing a stereo track is kind of is definitely frowned upon by especially by the engineers they don't want to be associated with music that is just an up mix they want to they want to actually do the work and separate the uh, you know the ob the objects in in Atmos or Sony or whatever, um, so yeah, that, I think, and uh, to to some to some extent it can save you can get the same kind of result, but a lot quicker because you're already working with the stereo master and they're always they're always trying to match the the stereo in terms of how it sounds and how it feels. They're not trying to change. Like the artist decided that is how they wanted the stereo track to sound. So, so, the, so the the original master tapes might not even be an advantage then, right? Is, is, do I understand that right? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, you might okay. you might find that because everyone's familiar, especially with older mm. songs, that's, they're so familiar with that stereo track that you, even in a spatial sense, you can't change it too much because it will lose it will lose the um, the intent of the artist originally. Uh, said and signed off that piece of music so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, engineers of you know amateur engineers have told me they like the fact that they're starting with the the actual stereo sound but they've got mm. the freedom to move it because of they mixed mm -hmm, it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so there's definitely you know i mean obviously the artifacting can become an issue if they if they do want to stray far from the stereo field because if something is separated and it's not really really clean you cannot move it to extremes it will you will know your brain will just say oh this sounds like there's a bit of a hole there in the in the audio which is coming back to the demudding and all sorts of stuff it's all related to that so yeah no it's um yeah i know it's, it's a i know it's, i've spoken to a couple of engineers that are in nam at the moment and i know it's quite a quite a topic the demixing side of it um for for atmos because of this out and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I imagine, I imagine that. Yeah, ten percent is kind of you know, it's it's uh, it can be a lot. <laughs> yeah, for some artists, well, the top some, that top yeah, sort of one percent, yeah. it can be a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. not 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 for me. I, I think yeah, I no. earn like I, I earn like five cents or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, oh Jesus. Okay. So so next next thing, and that's actually something that got me excited. But that's something that uh, essentially is a little bit away from from you guys. Uh, and SSA plugins, which is a developer of Ambisonics plugins, came out with a an update to their plugin suite, and uh, their plugins in are now tenth order Ambisonics. 
That is possible because yeah. Reaper can now do 128 channel tracks and 10th order ambisomics <laughs> needs 121 channels. So you have 121 <laughs> channel audio. That is the nerdest thing ever. It's, it's, <laughs> 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 and and you can do that. And I actually tried it out, and it's surprising. It, it, surprisingly, it is is actually quite efficient. I, I was I was thinking that I yeah. probably need a supercomputer to run it, like something that Anthony had, like with <laughs> with an A six thousand, which is like <laughs> a super GPU. <laughs> but but no, actually, it, it actually runs fine. The, wow. the, it was most surprising. But but Reaper looks to, totally weird with kind of this one hundred and twenty one kind of channel kind of meters. <laughs> <laughs> so, you get about three three meters on a whole screen <laughs> yeah yeah it's like <laughs> it's like it's like absurd but i kind of i, I talked to uh to peter from uh, ssa plugins actually i had the, the beta versions before it was released and he said he knows that that is complete overkill but it doesn't he did it anyway because i mean first of all it's possible and then uh that they're probably i mean there is a market for those things you know kind of 121 channels and i'm not really that much of an expert in that but uh people tell me me that once you get uh, beyond 100 speaker setups and there are these speaker setups especially if you are in an environment where you have multiple listeners um so for example in a stadium or something uh then yeah. uh, then these high channel counts actually make sense um yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously for for you and me it doesn't so yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you if you have like even if you have an atmos setup uh, uh third yeah, fine. yeah i was just but thinking you, in, within 10 tracks you could well in 10 tracks of 10th order you would be in like thousands of channels <laughs> Um, which yeah. is kind of more than even the largest orchestra, probably. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's sort of you know one thing about Ambisonics is that there are certain um, certain computations in Ambisonics that are much more efficient than in channel based audio, and there are other that uh. are less efficient. So, for example, uh, head tracking is extremely efficient in Ambisonics because a rotation is a linear transformation in Ambisonics. Uh, so, kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there are certain things that are much much faster in Ambisonics. So, so 121 channel is nothing but uh but there are other things where things get a little icky <laughs> yeah right yeah 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 <laughs> yeah and and then we had and then we had two announcements and one and that's something i think uh sam you have been always excited about and that is sort of gpu audio they announced i think it's yeah. a collaboration with uh with um forgot with whom uh they are um, about to release a a, a special audio it's with uh, man, uh, mantra M man, mantra, mantra I, 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 I wasn't quite sure the there's, yeah. yeah without the a, i wasn't quite sure if it's mantra 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 yeah of, so yeah, yeah this mantra. follows on from the kind of uh, their first gpu audio's first partnership was with vienna with the mir um, that was also reverb. gpu audio yeah that was also it's, gpu oh, okay. audio yeah oh, so okay. this oh. this is kind of using CUDA cores to process audio instead of um, the CPU. Um, so not, I, I suppose it, it, you could say it's related to the, the demixing side of stuff a little bit. Um, they're using the, the, the huge number of cores that are available in um, CUDA to, to process lots of streams of audio in parallel, basically. I think that's the the idea. So for things like a reverb, and I think this one is more down what I was getting excited about with kind of trying to physically model how the sound is working in a room. Like a, a basic reverb is just kind of a, a reflection and kind of a, yeah, delay, you need, you and need, a delay or whatever. It's, right, it's, an right. emula it's an emulation of what is actually happening. Whereas with a GPU, because you've got so many parallel processes possible, all right. at very low latency, you can almost model each individual kind of like a, it's not a particle but you could imagine it like a sound particle bouncing off a wall and you can i think that's that uh, build up very realistic very dense reverbs um or very realistic reverbs i think that's the idea but um yeah yeah it's, it's, so this is quite new so i've not had a chance to look at it i don't know if there's a demo i think or not. i think, I think it's, it isn't out yet that should just announce ah, it if i'm, if I'm right. completely mistaken yeah. but that's going to be an interesting one um there was yep. there was uh, a comment on one of my videos which was interesting and I, I kind of I have not yet found because quite frankly I don't have uh, Mir so I don't have the Vienna kind of version of GPU audio but there was somebody who commented that uh, when he was running the GPU audio version of the Vienna reverb then uh, certain other plugins would crash um, 
so mm. so um so kind of it's 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 opening a completely new field that that I think is interesting yeah. um uh, and uh, and kind of make, making access of the of the GPU yeah like so yeah for, so for, G- for, yeah yeah GPU audio is the kind of like the SDK to create the VST plugin yeah kind of with so it's like a it's like um yeah it, it's giving the developers a way to access the GPU but through the familiarity of a VST development, which is what they're they're going to be used to. So, but yeah, no, no doubt there's there's glitches. Um, yeah, it, it, it was. I think it was with the immerse system, and I, I wasn't. I, I was thinking, and I honestly haven't looked into it yet. But it could very well be that certain developers already took advantage of GPUs without without kind of uh, mm. um, essentially making that much public. And then now these things are clashing. Right? So, so there's always the possibility. Anyway, that that, that, that was something mm. that I found was interesting. So, yeah. So if you if you if you are kind of uh, going into that uh, that realm, be be aware that. That these are the new things and uh, unexpected things can happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then the ha- I have one more thing, uh, which was an announcement. That's actually a minor announcement. Even Tight kind of updated their black hole and micro pitch immersive plugins to be now nine point one point six. Um, they used to be, I think, only up to seven point one point four, but uh, yeah. now everybody seems to be going nine point one point six. So this seems to become the new standard in Dolby Atmos, right? Seem, yeah, I think people have well, similar to Amazonics, so the higher the higher the, the higher speaker than, count, kind yeah. of the higher the resolution, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think I think maybe a lot of it's driven that Pro Tools is now able to host kind of um, more than seven point one point two on a track or a bus. So I think that's part yeah, of it's, why it's, some it's of the of... it's quite even though it's not overall Pro Tools is not probably the most dominant door it's the most dominant in atmos so i think it, the development of atmos related or spatial related plugins generally follows yeah. Pro tools in some way um yeah i mean it's it's sort of uh that that, that is true and you know kind of pro tools and we talked earlier that that uh you know kind of max are still uh dominant in in the music space and quite frankly partly also because of pro tools because pro tools on windows is just a nightmare um, so if you want to use Pro Tools, you almost have to use a Mac, and uh, and uh, Mac uh, Pro Tools certainly still leads the way, at least in the in the industry, and which is a good thing. You know, kind of a uh, nine point one point six wasn't wasn't particularly well defined uh, how the speaker layout is actually done. So kind of having at least now the Pro Tools standard, I think, helps uh, to mm-hmm. to standardize everything. I think that's going to be important. Yeah. And I think that that was pretty much everything that we had so far. Once again, you know, kind of as we are recording this, there are probably new things coming out because uh, NAM is happening at this point. Uh, all the things that are going to happen after we record that we're going to cover in, in the next <laughs> month, uh, next month episode, which will be in March. Uh, yeah. And uh, and I think that was everything. Or, or Sam, do you have anything else? No, just to say um, many thanks to to Anthony, to Anjok. Um, yeah, we'll we'll give all the links out to what what we covered um where to uh download the, the ultimate vocal remover um uh, have you got anything else you'd like to to say anthony no just thank <laughs> you for having me i appreciate it it's been a pleasure been a pleasure yeah. thank no, you, thank you very much explain everything no yeah, I th- yeah. I th- well hopefully a lot because i think a lot of it is kind of like a not a black art but it's just not a familiar kind of thing, even in audio, like you speak to engineers and they don't really got a clue what you're talking about when you, when you're saying, Oh, we can demix the vocal or, yeah. you know, um, there's these models that we can use and they were, Oh, I use isotope RX. It doesn't do a very good job. And I, I, but I would it's, assume it, it's, it's, it was unheard of even just 10 years ago. Oh yeah. 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 No, no, I, every day. I, I, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I, every new, engineer that approaches me and says i've got this stereo track can you can you demix it every single one would say wow i've never heard anything separate that good before and they're they're in the industry full-time professionally so i think a lot of it is this disconnect where the the commercial side is almost not quite can be not quite as good as uh, because it's so well established yeah, yeah 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 I, th- I think I think one of one of the and, and I, I see I see this in our college right so so one of the things is that this is just a, a this is such a massive paradigm shift uh, in terms of uh, programming and how you develop software 
um, uh, these networks function completely differently and the vast majority of people have not yet made that switch. So they think in terms of algorithms and sort of ifs and whens and theirs and kind of uh, all, all, these, all these traditional kind of uh, flowcharts and uh, don't really understand that these uh, programs work completely differently and therefore have a completely different uh, realm of possibilities um, and uh, are also kind of advancing much much faster than anything else because because essentially they are they are, they have to be trained they are, they are not really programmed they are trained really right yeah. so, so I, I think I think uh, uh, a lot of people will be surprised what's going to happen over the next next couple of years these things are going to develop so fast um, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I, I I I would be if you if I would be you. It's it's sort yeah. of uh, you know, you have something really special and and kind of um, you know kind of thank you for that. No, th thank thanks you. again for having me. Okay, cool. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks everybody. It was my pleasure to be the host here, even though I kind of uh, was mainly listening today. But uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, once again, um, if you have not subscribed to this channel yet, please do so immediately uh, because we are going to come out with the next episode uh, in a month or so and it's going to be equally uh, exciting and uh, you know kind of uh, if you have any questions or comments you can always use the comment section or you can yep. also reach us directly we have some links in the description below and uh, with that being said see you at the next podcast cheers out bye guys <laughs>